Um, okay, hi, my name is Alex McLean. I'm uh, CEO of uh, Alveol. Alveol is a um, urban beekeeping company that does a lot more than urban beekeeping today. Um, we started out very simply as wanting to produce honey on rooftops and to give it out to people in that building and realized that people deeply needed a stronger connection to nature and focused really on the connection to nature as a business. Today, we work on over 3,000 different rooftops in 45 different cities through Canada, the US, and Europe. And our goal is to connect people to nature and hopefully in the future make cities more bee friendly. We're not too far down down the line. Um, we're running a series of webcasts. This is the first one, so I'll just introduce it. Um, the idea is a quarterly webcast hosted by myself where we're exploring uh, topics, research, and trends uh, that are relevant to bee friendly cities. That's greener and more resilient urban spaces and built environments. In each webcast, uh, we'll host three different uh, speakers, and the idea is to have thought-provoking conversations with experts, scientists, researchers, and change makers who see cities as being at the root of change. Uh, we'll explore a wide range of topics at the intersection of conservation, urban planning, and architecture. The topic today, I'm very happy we're starting with this one because this is one of my favorites actually, is about lawns. The theme is expansive lawns or expensive lawns, how sustainable landscaping is better for bees, buildings, and budgets alike. Uh, we're joined today by three wonderful people. Thank you so much for saying a yes to this. Uh, Douglas Tallamy, uh, Matthew Shefford, and Amy Hovis. Uh, I'd like just to send it over your way, just so you can introduce yourself and 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 just kind of give a quick intro about who you are and a little bit of why you're joining, and then we'll jump into kind of the meat of the topic for today. So maybe uh, I'll start with you, uh, Amy. Hi. Um, yes, my name is Amy Hovis, and I have a landscape design build company called Eden in Austin, Texas. We do both residential and commercial projects. I've been in this field for a long time. And this is a subject that I'm very passionate about. I also have a, a nursery here in Austin. And so I deal with customers as well as clients. And so I really get a good perspective of what the need is out there. And as a designer and a contractor, I am so tired of seeing the same you know, lawns being installed and after lawn being installed and the regulations that are um, ensuring that lawns get installed only for us to have to come and take them out. And um, I'm really excited about this conversation. I'm very passionate about it. So thank you for inviting us. Well, Amy, thank you so much for being part of this. Um, and I have a ton of questions for you, uh, especially because <laughs> the intersection there and you, you have to uh, uh, probably deal with a lot of um, awareness building, I guess, uh, maybe is the best way to say it. Um, Matthew, let's go to go, go to yourself. Yeah, no, great. Well, thanks for inviting me to participate in this. Um, I work for an environmental nonprofit called the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation, and our um, work is focused upon protecting um, insects, um, other invertebrates, and their habitats. Um, personally, I've been involved with pollinator conservation for a couple of decades, and a lot of that has been focused on working with local communities. Um, gardeners, park managers, um, local community groups, master gardeners, all sorts of different people to try and make our landscapes in our neighborhoods and our communities better for bees. Um, and yeah, for that, I mean, yeah, a lot of time I'm encouraging people to do better things with their lawns because otherwise, you know, the 40 million acres of lawns we have in the United States is essentially worthless for wildlife. I definitely agree, Matthew. Um, Doug, I'll go to you, to you. And I agree with Matthew too. I'm Doug Tallamy and I wish I had an accent like Matthew because <laughs> then I could really sound educated. Um, I've been in University of Delaware 42 years now. Um, I'm an entomologist, behavioral ecologist, um, got into uh, conservation of food webs really when we moved into a property in Pennsylvania it was thoroughly overrun with with uh, invasive species. <clears throat> that introduced me to the the degree to which invasives have taken over the world. Um, the fact that our insects don't use them very effectively, they're pushing out the native plants. The overabundance of deer that encourage those natives. All of the bad practices that are preventing our landscapes from doing the four things they need to do. Every landscape needs to preserve pollinators. Every landscape needs to preserve a food web. Every landscape needs to manage the watershed and every landscape needs to sequester carbon. 
Lon does none of those things. So I'm anxious to join this conversation. Um, what's the state today of kind of landscaping and lawns and, and, and what's the situation? We'll speak, I think, specifically about the U.S. today. Um, why are we in the position that we are today? And what does it mean uh, in terms of sustainability today to have such expansive lawns? We've got about 44 million acres of lawn in this country, which is an area bigger than the size of New England. <clears throat> and if you if you pay attention to your lawn at all and do what the lawn care industry says you should do, it's an ecological deadscape. And that's embedded in, in a matrix of 135 million acres of residential landscapes. None of it is designed to run the ecosystems that support us. Uh, and we're seeing the statistics today that, that show the results of this type of, of lack of, of uh, land care. We've lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. We've got global insect decline. The UN says we're going to lose a million species in the next 20 years. We're in the middle of the sixth great extinction event that the earth has ever experienced. Uh, it's not just news. Um, it's it's scary news because it is the biodiversity on this planet that supports us. So changing this, changing the declines, stopping them, reversing them is an absolute necessity. Uh, we've got parks and we've got preserves, and yet we're still in the great six, six great extinction event, which means we need to start practicing conservation outside of those parks and preserves. That is on private property. Uh, and again, much of that private property is lawn. It's it's the low hanging fruit. We can easily put the plants that run our ecosystems into those spaces. Okay, thank you. And Matthew, going in your direction, why have we landed in this place? And I, I know a lot of it is um, cultural, but but why have we decided uh, as Americans to 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 do such a terrible thing? Um, I. I mean, my understanding is that the, this image of the lawn as the landscape of a successful person um, is largely inherited from Europe and in particular from Britain, I suspect, um, because, you know, you travel across much of Europe and you look at the gardens there and they're not lawns. You know, they're kind of formal French parterre and the Italian courtyards and so on. But you go to Britain and it's a wet, damp country, mild, and grass grows well. Um, and, you know, the, so you also had this uh, movement towards the great landscape parks of the country homes, which are this idealized countryside of large expanses of grass with clusters of trees. Um, and then uh, when people from Britain and elsewhere in Europe arrived in this country, I think they probably ended up in that part of the United States where, where you could also grow grass successfully. Um, and they culturally they brought in some of these same expectations and there's now this um, embedded association of lawn with beauty and lawn with success and lawn with respectability um, and so what we find now is that we're pushing back to try and get people to make their lawns more interesting either by growing plants and flowers in them or by replacing them but there's this embedded enthusiasm for lawns and sometimes that's a personal thing people are like horrified that you might let your lawn look less than ideal and sometimes it's built into the neighborhood requirements even in desert areas there are homeowners and community associations that say your landscape must be lawn um, and so when people are trying to replace that with xeriscaping and native plants is suitable to live in the desert they get pushed back and they get told to pull them out and put back grass Amy, I'm interested in hearing your take because because some of the stuff we hear sometimes from from um, you know landlords or people that own their homes mm -hmm. is the kind of economic difference there or that that um, you're I feel like the exact uh, right person to understand what are the economic differences from you know setting up a more traditional lawn to a more um, sustainable landscape. Can you speak to us a little bit about that and the kind of differences that we should know about? Yeah, um, for one thing. Um... It's one of the things that we suggest when we're dealing with a lot of land to seed for wildflowers, for bees, for butterflies. So it's very economical. Um, it's been a myth that putting down turf is the cheapest thing to do because it is maybe for the builder when they're doing it really quickly, but then for us to come back and recreate nature is so much more expensive. And to do that right the first time is so much easier. And we do definitely, yes, you're right, it is a disaster <laughs> and we have to do something quickly, but we can and it's so easy. And I'm excited about how we are changing the aesthetics 
So it used to be that when you were wealthy, you would have this, you know, magical lawn and it would all be green. And now we're we're slowly changing the aesthetic to show that actually what you want is to be able to use your property in your yard and to see living creatures, to be able to discover nature, to be able to be a part of nature, to not only do the right thing um, in creating a wonderful ecological site where you have birds and butterflies that you're inviting nature back in, but also it's just, it's the difference between a dead area um, where nothing is happening except for we're spending money on um, watering it, on keeping it green, on fighting nature to the other extreme of this beautiful wonderland that you want to have coffee out every morning, where you want to enjoy the sun go down, where you want to actually spend time connected to nature. And so it's shifting, it's slowly shifting, but, and we have to move faster though, because um, we're still, I'm still dealing with properties where um, the builders are putting in turf that is really invasive sometimes and the wrong turf even for the environment. And we are spending so much energy and money pulling out that turf because it's so bad for the environment. Whereas we could just seed a wildflower meadow and have this glorious, wonderful yard instantly. And it would be so much cheaper and so much better for the homeowners and for the environment. Let's just to um, play devil's advocate for one second here. Uh, Doug, I want to send you a little curveball. Are there any <laughs> positive aspects to a lawn? And, and the reason I ask is I was listening to a, a podcast recently, which I thought was not going to going to go in, in it was going to go in a direction exactly like like all three of of you know it's a, it's a disaster and the podcast for some reason went completely in a different direction a very reputable person but but actually explaining kind of some of the benefits i'd be curious to hear doug if you uh if you have any agreement whatsoever that there may be a positive aspect or is it all is it all really um uh, terrible no i'm going to hit that curveball because uh mm -hmm. there's some positive aspects uh, notice, I don't say get rid of the lawn. I say reduce the area that's in lawn. Lawn is a cue for care. It it fits into our current status symbol. Um, it's a mechanism by which we can ecologically enhance our private properties without being thrown out of our, our neighborhood. Um, so you're going to have more plants in your yard. You're going to have bigger beds. You can have pocket meadows. You can have big meadows, but they're going to be outlined with, with lawn that is manicured, that is mode right next to the sidewalk right next to the to the driveway uh, and that is a cue that you get it you know what the social standard is uh, you're not going to be fine you're just going to have more plants more productive plants in your in your yard acres and acres of lawn total disaster and and no one should accept that but swaths of of, of grass that allow you to move through your property um now, if you're in an area where it's too dry, even for that, then it's not acceptable. And there's a lot of places in this country where, where that's true. But east of the Mississippi, uh, you, can, you can get away with that. If you find you have to water your yard, your lawn, then get rid of it. But there's a lot of places where you don't have to. And just, just mow it once in a while and everybody's happy. So I do think it, it serves a very important purpose that way. Um, not ecologically, but, but sociologically. Mm-hmm. And, and it's something to keep in keep in mind. Like we we people still use their areas and and need them. Um, well, well, that's that's another thing. If you have kids and they're going to play kickball or something, that's a, a short period of your life where okay, you're providing that space. Those kids grow up fast and they leave. Uh, so <laughs> have plans to convert it. <laughs> Matthew, you mentioned um, the kind of bylaws of cities. I, I read your recent piece, uh, or I'm not sure, not sure if it was a recent piece, but um, relatively recent piece on on no Momay and your position about no no Um I'm curious to hear hear uh, that you know the, the no Momay and the, the the policies in different cities. What's the what's the direction you would take uh, with with that? And 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 I'd love to hear again your position on on um, on that um, uh, that uh, annual program, or not program, but annual uh, uh, thing, right? Sure. Yeah, no, um, Noma May is an, in, an intriguing beast <laughs> in many ways. I mean, it started in Britain. So, you know, it's like where, where, where I originate is where it comes from, um, started by Plant Life, um, a charity there. And it was um, a 
community in Wisconsin in Appleton that became the first one to really work on it here in, in the United States. Um, and Appleton and Lawrence University, which is in the city of Appleton, are both part of um, the B-City USA and B-Campus USA network, which is one of the initiatives that we run at the Xerces Society. Um, and so because of that, people started coming to us and saying, so no more May, what do you think about it? And we're like, no more what? Um, <laughs> and so we, we, and we, so we quickly realized that, I mean, the folks in Appleton actually had the right approach, but a lot of other communities were jumping on this. And it was just this really simplistic approach of leave your mower in the, in the shed, let your lawn grow and, you know, everything's going to be great. Um, and then, you know, at the end of May, you get your lawnmower back out and you start cutting again. And it's like, so you've achieved almost nothing. Um, but no mow may as, you know, as a thing. I mean, there are now hundreds of communities trying to participate in this. And we realized that, goodness, if, if we didn't try and shift how they were doing it, it could be this kind of greenwashing. A lot of people would like go around like, yeah, whoa. I save the bees, I let my lawn grow for a month. It's like, you haven't had any serious impact at all. Um, and so we um, stepped in and started trying to shift that conversation to get people to understand that, you know, there are some benefits from having some dandelions or white clover in your lawn, but it's not great. Um, and I mean, dandelions is a plant, a problematic plant anyway. Um, it's like they're kind of fast food for, for bees at best, but they do fill a gap when there's nothing. But as a plant, dandelions actually suppress the growth of other plants. They're, they're um, allelopathic. Um, and so that like their sap and their roots and their leaves, you see in it, their leaf rosette and you get a patch of dead grass when you pull it up. So they do that and their pollen spreads with some insects and suppresses the reproduction of other plants. So it's like, they're pretty and um, have become almost like the, the poster child for this, but they're really not great. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, our approach to Nomo May is that we think that Nomo May is a fantastic conversation starter because people are so attached to their lawns and you see it all the time. Someone says, let's do Nomo May and someone else jumps up and says, no. And I'm like, great, let's have a conversation. Um, and that is, to us, that's one of the major benefits of, of Nomo May is this ability to start conversation about that featureless grass, about what we can do to move it. How can we shift the intensity, make it, you know, have people mow less maybe, or reduce the intensity of mowing, or don't use that weed and feed, which is running off and polluting the creeks. Um, and, you know, all those other things are beginning to move people away from unblemished manicured landscapes. And I know that a lawn like that is not as good as if it were a meadow or a native plant, but not everybody wants that. And so we're trying to bridge that gap to provide people with an easy step away from nothing to something and then keep moving them along to something that will be better and better each year. And so I just want to double click a little bit on that, Matthew. How do you, or how does our society balance that? The um, early motivation of someone wanting to do something, so the potentially positive side of a Nomo May campaign, um, how do you manage to maintain that motivation and momentum, but still bring them to a place that's, uh, that's, um, that's further? Like what, how do you, how do you balance those two things? Yeah, I mean, our, our work has mostly been through the B-City network and the B-Campus network. Um, we've kind of limited ourselves to that. And there are about 350 communities now part of that. And that's been our, our focus of getting information out. Um, and partly because those are communities with, we already have an existing relationship and we're already providing information to support them. Um, and so no more may for them has, for those communities in that network that have joined and has become one more tool that they can use. Um, and so we're supporting them. And so you know, each of those communities has their own um, group of advocates for pollinators, for native plants, for more habitat. Um, the broader debate, there's only 
you know, we don't have as much interaction or connection with those communities. So we use opportunities like this to talk about it. We, um, last year and this, this May as well, we get a lot of invitations to do media interviews. And so we've talked with many different um, journalists on, you know, print and TV and radio and so on. Um, and so we are working through that to try and um, take any opportunity we can to, to get people to hopefully understand that no more may is not the end point. Um, you know, this should, not knowing for a few weeks should not be the end point of bee conservation. You know, it can be an initial step um, and there's more things that people can be doing and more information that's available to them. Okay, thank you. Amy, you want to shift gears a little bit here and, and talk a bit about the kind of commercial setting. I know I know that you do work on on um, well multiple different uh, areas, but but you you are on the residential and on the commercial side. Um, what are the differences that you see in between those those two mentalities? Is one shifting faster than the other? Uh, are we seeing more awareness come from residentials, or are we seeing more awareness come from commercials? Um, there's a lot of pressure from different. Um, certifications now and all that on the sustainability side is that affecting in any way how commercials are thinking about their properties or is the awareness coming more on the residential side now it's um here in austin it's really coming from both um you have um a lot of smart folks here that are wanting to do the right thing and they just need to know what is the right thing um so that's a part of it but there's also um you know as we're experiencing change in climate we're having these freezes where all of our plants die. And so people are finally really starting to embrace native plants. And so that's kind of our entry to having that discussion. And they, um, they're they all coming around. Um, every project that I'm associated with is wanting to have it, some kind of ecology happening on their site. They understand the need to bring in bees. They understand, and they want to, and they understand the need to um, have, you know, habitat for animals to hide and for insects and how important that is. And they actually want that. They also, more than anything on a commercial job, they want the plants to live. They want to do it once and they want it to succeed. And I completely understand that. And that's what I believe in doing anyway. I, you know, don't want to bring a Japanese garden to Austin, Texas. I want to bring native plants that are going to thrive and that I'm going to go back to these projects and they're going to be killing it, you know, years and years later. Um, so we know what to plant. Um, and now it's starting a conversation with both, both commercial projects and um, with homeowners. They come to the nursery, for example, or they come when they want to do an Eden project and they're just tell me what to do. I, I want, I'm, I want in. <laughs> so it's really more about um, you know, being able to fulfill all of these new um, residential and commercial projects because in our industry is so swamped right now because people do want to get rid of their lawns and they do want to um, create habitat, um, commercial projects and residential projects. And we're all just trying to keep up. So that is a the problem that we want to have. And the nursery has always been more focused on native plants, right? That's been a kind of- That's right, exactly. This nursery was founded on that and, and um, it's all a part of our philosophy. We grow native plants that you can't find anywhere else so that we can keep them, you know, so that we can keep planting them. And with our Eden projects, we're always, we're trying to change the aesthetic. We are really working hard so that um, people want what they see is beautiful in a magazine. And so if they see, you know, more native plants and if they realize how much fun it is to go outside and watch birds and how beautiful it is to invite nature back in then we can really change the way that people not only think about things but what they want and that's really the best way to um, motivate people to make a change okay thanks thank you okay doug going uh, to you um not a curveball this time, a simple one. Um, I, just for our listeners that that maybe don't understand kind of the the impact that native um, uh, plants can have versus non-native, can you? I know you're you're. This is really an area of expertise for you. Can you touch on that uh, for us, just so we can understand just how different those uh, two things are? 
Sure. Uh, the connection really is is whether or not they're going to support insect populations. You know, <clears throat> way back in 1987, E.O. Wilson told us that insects are the little things that run the world. And, and most people get the pollinator part. We need pollinators. It's always tied to agriculture. We actually need pollinators for 80% of our plants and 90% of our flowering plants. So forget the agriculture. We need plants everywhere and we need pollinators everywhere. But what about the other insects? We need decomposers to re recycle nutrients, but we also need insects to pass energy from plants to the rest of the animals in the ecosystem. Um, because most vertebrates do not eat plants directly. They eat insects that ate those plants. And the ones that do that more than any other type of plant eater is caterpillars. So we can simplify and say, we need plants that make caterpillars. Okay, what's gonna make caterpillars? Non-native plants are very poor at making caterpillars because plants don't wanna be eaten by caterpillars. They protect themselves with nasty chemicals and only the caterpillars that have adapted to those, those defenses can actually eat it. And I always use the monarch butterfly as an example. You know, milkweeds are toxic plants, but monarchs can eat them because they've got the adaptations that get around the cardiac glycosides and the sticky latex sap. And it's a wonderful relationship as long as you have milkweeds around. But the monarch's locked into eating milkweeds. And if you take them away and, and put a crepe myrtle there, the monarch is not going to be able to eat it. And that's one of the reasons our insects are disappearing. Um, so the plants that evolved in other continents don't have those specialized relationships with our local insects, uh, which means for the most part, they are unable to pass on their energy. So they're, they're decorations, but they're not functional members of our, of our food webs. That's the important feature of, of natives that, uh, that needs to be explained. Most people just don't, don't understand that. I, um, I love also your, um, 10 step program for, for people that uh, start to see more. I, I'll, I'll let you explain what it is, but I was actually at a, a site today and I tried to use that <laughs> line with someone. Uh, yeah. um, that's, that's, some yeah, that's actually not mine. That's a uh, woman, Tammany Baumgarten in uh, New Orleans. I heard her talk about it and she says, uh, yeah, use the 10 step program, take 10 steps back from your trees and all your insect problems disappear. <laughs> uh, so it's funny, but it's also true because we view our trees at a distance. We're, you know, you're not there inspecting every leaf, and there is something eaten out of most leaves. Uh, and there can be huge numbers of caterpillars on those trees, but you don't see them. It doesn't destroy the aesthetic value of that tree, but it does make that tree a functioning member of your, your local ecosystem. Um, the notion that if you have an insect on your plant, it's going to kill it is, is nuts. I mean, insects have always been associated with our plants. They're very good at handling typical levels of herbivory. And the insects that that influence people the most are the invasive insects. The ones we brought into this country, like the gypsy moth, which is now the spongy moth and the emerald ash borer and the hemlock woolly adelgid and all these things that are here from other continents that have no natural enemies. So they're the problem makers because there's no nothing above them keeping them uh, controlled. But our native insects have tons of natural enemies and, and diseases and um, so they rarely get get to the point where they defoliate anything. Ten step pro actually no, I love I love bugs and insects, so I'm, I'm not going to I'm going to do the one step program. <laughs> um, I, I speak from experience. We we have a lot of people that um, all we do all day is is introduce people to uh, bees and native pollinators, and 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 so um, when we see people walk away. Those are the people we latch on to the most. Like, okay, this is the person that we have to convince and, and try to bring them back to take those 10 step backs. And um, that's a um, mm -hmm. sign of a good day is we've managed to do that. We have a we have a lot of native plants planted for display at the nursery so that people can understand how you can put them together and how amazing they are. And you'll see, we have all these areas where insects are naturally on them and there's these beautiful caterpillars and so we are they're like little stopping areas where people can learn and they get so excited kids are now you know getting excited about insects and how beneficial they are and so it's a lot of work to change you know people's ideas about bugs but um we see a lot of people really just understanding it right away and getting excited about it so that's been really fun yeah i know <laughs> I'm just going to add to that when I give talks, um, 
I talk about all the other things, you know, we need to provide the entire life cycle of our insects and so on. And, and I say, and in the end, you know, you're doing this for your garden and your garden will be chewed and you'll have holes in your leaves and they'll be blemished. And, you know, but this is why you're doing it, you know. So get used to it, pull up a chair and watch and enjoy. Exactly. <laughs> enjoy the show. Yeah. Matthew, let's uh, get a little bit more um, concrete here for for some people that might be listening to this. So, so uh, you know, most people that will be listening to this um, are are going to be more on the commercial side that have a property with a lot of um, a lot of lawns uh, and uh, have you know, and frankly, sometimes tenants that are putting a lot of pressure for those lawns to be immaculate and clean. And and um, what would you tell a person like that? That's kind of in the middle. That 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 has, if they're listening to this, is they probably have an interest and they probably understand that lawns. Mm-hmm. Are- but they're a little bit stuck in between kind of the, the status quo and what's required there. What would you say to that person in terms of first steps and what that person can do um, in order to get into a place where we're, we're being a bit more sustainable with the landscaping? Goodness. And you said you're going to throw a curveball at, at Doug. And... <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, this is, this is a great question and this is something that everybody's wrestling with. I mean, I, I mostly work with um, gardeners, park managers and, and and some golf course superintendents um and you know in most of those situations it's either it's their, their property and so they kind of get to do what they want and they're moving towards it or there's like public pressure you know park managers there's a sense you know in the local community that or their um advisory committee has said hey why don't you go and do this or you know for golf courses it's the golfers are saying like wouldn't it be beautiful if we had this meadow here um and, but that has come from a result of them being exposed to ideas outside and you know listening to conversations or reading articles. And so I think that a lot of it, um, at least for the um, kind of the, the, the landlords, the land man, the land um, the property managers and so on, some of it will need to come from them. You know, if they as a company wish to shift to um, more sustainable landscaping, then they can come up with a plan, but they do need to talk to the tenants. Um, But there may also be tenants who want to see these changes and not quite sure how to start. You know, um, know, for some companies, you know, the employees get a sense of satisfaction by working for a company that cares, you know? Um, And so I think that there is going to be pressure from both sides and maybe, you know, that movement is already building nobody's had that conversation to find out and so it may be the first step may actually need to be kind of it's almost like let's have a courageous conversation about this and see what people really want and if the the property managers decided that they would like to you know have a meadow instead of just grass or you know put flowers in or whatever then you know they can take that opportunity to also try and ease the tenants towards where the property manager would like to go yeah, and, and as um, Doug was saying earlier, maybe only a portion as well, right? And keeping keeping mm-hmm. some very clean lawns, but some areas that are a bit more um, uh, meadows. Well, sorry for the curveball. Uh, no, that's all right. <laughs> no, it wasn't really, but I was like, oh, it's a big question. I would, I would love to answer that question. Yes. But, um, uh, it's something yeah. I'm so passionate about. I think yeah. that it can be solved with good design. I really mm-hmm. believe that with a smart design, um, you are bringing when it's done well, people are excited. They want that. They want that property. They want to be on that property. They want to experience that property. And so it is like you guys said, a compromise sometimes like, okay, you want some grass. I understand. We'll give you a little tiny square patch of grass. And then surrounded that is architectural statement plants that are native, that are going to be look great evergreen. And then there's flowing grasses that are going to bring movement into the project. And then there's beautiful flowering native plants that are going to invite birds, bees, and butterflies. And if you can design it into a way that creates space for humans, as well as the insects and butterflies and bees and little critters, then you can cohabitate well and create something that is not only important ecologically and better for the environment, but you can create something that humans actually are drawn to. And we are noticing that since we're doing such high in residential projects, like our projects are, um, these are for very wealthy people who can do whatever they want and they want that. 
they really are understanding that suburban has America is the lawn and they don't want that. They want something better and something better is something that we can completely embrace. And it is, like you said, just experiencing, you know, reality and nature and caterpillars eating your plant is actually an amazing experience. It's, it calms you down. It alleviates stress. We all know that this is important for us. And so if we can just change and we are the aesthetic, um, I really do believe through good design, then we are going to have people, you know, waiting in line for this. And we are seeing that. Um, so I am very positive that it's going to happen and it, that it is. It's just for these poor kind of suburban lots where they're just putting in sod and regulations that, you know, are for turf that we're just going to have to pull out eventually, that it's just got to stop and it's got to stop quickly. Um, and it's, there's just so many better ways that are, that are affordable and smart and elevated. Um, for, for me, one of the passions is about elevating your daily experience. And that is being surrounded by amazing nature, um, but in a beautiful way that inspires you and makes you want to work outside. And I want to spend my whole day outside. I'm outside all day long. <laughs> I love it. And it makes me a happier person. Um, and so, you know, I think we're getting there, but it's, it's, it's really, um, I think for those bigger commercial properties, it's just so easy to do what's been done over and over and over again. And it's going to take guts and it's going to take a little bit of tenacity, but it is, it is the future and it is among us. So it is happening. Wow. One other thing that, that really pushes this cultural change along is financial incentives. We could change the tax structure that would change things overnight. Um, you know, there's, there's a $3 per square foot rebate in California for every square foot of lawn you remove and put in Xeric plantings. You know, Minnesota has a cost sharing program where they're encouraging people to reduce or replace their lawn with Minnesota prairie plants. Any kind of financial incentive like that, it's not that you get rich doing it, but what it does is, is um, it takes away the cultural barriers. So that when the when the tenant says, oh, I want the big line, so, uh -uh, I'm getting paid to reduce this. It's the right thing to do. I'm helping the ecosystem and I don't care about you anymore, you know, <laughs> but it really it, it it pushes people over the edge to say this is this is a state sponsored move in the right direction. And we're all and it's also the future. You know, we're not going to hang on to the past. It's the future. So those are powerful arguments that that pull people who are hanging on to the old old ways along. <laughs> I do, I do agree that um, it is the future in terms of people are not going to want that. I mean, people are already not wanting that. People who have a lot of money who get to decide, they do not want lawn. <laughs> they are embarrassed to have lawn. Yeah. And they are, they are, you know, they want to do something that's, you know, what they think of as expensive, which is actually the most, you know, affordable thing that they can do. Um, but they are, they are noticing they don't want to have a house that looks like another house, which has a lawn, like the other well, kind of, we call it old fashioned. Um, so I, you know, it's just, it's just a matter of time and continuing to educate people about what's happening. I think this has been amazing. Uh, thank you so much for like the passionate answers. Um, Doug, anything else you would like to add today or? I always like to end these by emphasizing the personal responsibility that, that everybody has towards good earth stewardship. Everybody requires healthy ecosystems. Everybody, whether you're red or blue or a tree hugger or not, which means everybody has a responsibility helping those ecosystems continue to function. Um, and most people don't know that. You know, they think that an ecologist somewhere, a conservation biologist is going to do it. And everybody else has a green light to wreck the planet. Those days are, are, are done. So everybody has a responsibility. And I say, if you focus on the land that you own, your private property, it empowers you. Don't think about the entire planet because you'll get depressed doing that. But you can make a difference right where you live. You can see that difference. That empowers you. You might want to do it, do it again. Um, so personal responsibility. That's how I want to end. Oh, thank you. Amy? 
Um, I love that. Um, I also believe and try to help people understand that like, this is your chance. This is it. You can make a difference and it's so easy and it's so fun. And why wouldn't you want to do that? Um, you're going to have success. You're going to have plants that live. You're going to, you're creating legacy. Um, there's so many benefits to doing the right thing, but also it's, it will bring you pleasure. It will excite you. It will be fun to live in this beautiful property that's alive instead of a property that's just doing absolutely nothing. And the other thing would be in terms of any developers, please, please, please consider not doing this because we are spending, so homeowners are spending so much money having to get rid of that lawn. Once you put it in, it's actually, I don't want to, you know, I want to get everyone knowing that it, you can get rid of it and please do, but it's just causing this huge extra expense and step. And I promise everyone is going to want to get rid of their lawns at some point. It may take, you know, some communities a little bit longer, but it is definitely the thing of the past. And so please stop doing it because it's just adding more and more cost in terms of getting rid of it. And some of them are very invasive and they hold on and it's expensive to do that. Okay, so all developers out there, listen. Please, please, please. Uh -huh. Matthew, any closing uh, thoughts? Yeah, um, what Doug and Amy just said are both wonderful. Um, and I was going, what else can I add to that? Because it's like, I feel like everything's already been covered. But I do want to say that particularly when we started talking about insect conservation and, and pollinators, which there's this very, I mean, you can be very selfish about this and say, goodness, you know, every day of my life benefits is better, is improved by the food or the, the fabric, you know, or the beauty around me, thanks to pollinators. And pollinator conservation is one of those conservation issues that you can really step in and contribute to in a very direct way. It's not something that esoteric, and you know, it doesn't happen off in a distant wilderness or a, a, you know, a vast ocean. It's something that happens right in your neighborhood, quite literally in your backyard. And what you do can have a direct impact and a direct benefit. And you don't have to take your entire yard and transform it in one go. You can take little steps. You can, you know, do a little bit this year, do a little bit next year. Think about the plants you're growing grow more natives, grow plants that bloom you know, all through the season to support the pollinators all year, have the right kind of plants to provide the nest sites that you know, the twig nesting bees require, or don't put mulch down everywhere, have some bare ground so that our ground nesting bees have somewhere, because you're trying to support the entire life cycle. I know you may think of gardening, you're actually creating an ecosystem and habitat. Um, and this is, this is something that, that you can do at your own pace. There's no absolute right or wrong way of doing it. And then take those steps that you feel comfortable with, but take those steps and move towards a better landscape and, and better conditions in your neighborhood. Um, and you can have that satisfaction of like, wow, I'm doing this good thing, but you also have the direct enjoyment of fitting and living in a beautiful landscape. And, the hum and the movement that around you. And so it's, it is an incredibly satisfying thing to do. Matthew, Amy, Doug, thank you so much. I'm uh, very thankful for you sharing uh, today. Hopefully we've convinced a few people to, uh, <laughs> but I'm sure we have with the quality of the conversation we just had today.